And Jesus comes to Nicodemus, and you have to understand, Nicodemus has heard about or either seen the little girl be resurrected from the dead. Tell somebody I'm about it, about it. Nicodemus has either heard about or seen how the woman with the issue of blood touched the hem of his garment and her issue was healed. Tell somebody I'm about it, about it. Nicodemus has seen Lazarus resurrect from the grave. He has seen Jesus come inside of the temple and cast out a demonic spirit and seen the feeding of the 5,000. And Jesus does not keep to any of the religious Jewish traditions, but yet the Pharisees are astounded at his word because power comes from his mouth. Tell somebody, I'm about that kingdom life. And so all of a sudden, Jesus now, Nicodemus comes to Jesus at nighttime because he don't want nobody to see that he really is trying to find out about this life. And Jesus gives him instruction. Listen, he says, you can't even uh, see this kingdom unless you're born from up above. Tell somebody, get saved for real. I would dare say that still about 60% of the church is still unsaved. Meaning that they don't really know Jesus as their Lord. We heard about him as our Savior, but we don't really know him as our Lord. Tell somebody I'm about it, about him. All of a sudden, then he says, listen, you really can't even enter into what I'm talking about unless you experience two baptisms. Somebody say, get baptized with water. That's my life, and I'm about it, about it. Point at somebody from across the room and say, neighbor, now is a good time for you to get your life i'm about that kingdom that kingdom life and i'm about it about it come on good time to break protocol here in the chapel this morning feel good in here this morning come on go to somebody real quick real quick real fast real quick real fast real quick real fast come on grab hold with them real quick some of y'all ain't moving going nowhere and say i don't care what he say i'm tired i ain't going nowhere go to somebody real quick and say neighbor this is a good time right in the Lent season for you to get your life. I'm about that life, that kingdom life, and I'm about it, about it. Would you clap your hands and give the Lord glory and honor and praise this morning? I want to talk to you from the subject matter, kingdom life part two, kingdom life part two. Quickly, let's pray before you see it. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you, God, that you've got more in store for us in regards to your glory way before you come. And before we go to heaven, God, that if you wanted us to simply live a meager life, you could have saved us and taken us then. But God, you've got more on your agenda than that. And open our eyes that we may see and our ears that we may hear and our heart that we may understand the things that you have prepared for those of us who love you and will choose to live a kingdom life. Now, God, hide me behind the cross And that your people will only hear your voice and experience your presence so that we may come to understand the things of the kingdom and live and walk in them. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Somebody said, I'm about it, about it. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Yeah. All of us as human beings have a desire for immortality. What we really desire is the ability to control our own destiny. We desire to be free from the constraints of an existence that renders us helpless and limited to the power and control of others around us. It is why we often gravitate, like last week, to the idea of superheroes, Those who are graced and gifted with an extraordinary ability to perform and live beyond life's limitations. Tell somebody I'm about that life. As we were reminded last week, we have the ability as believers to live beyond the constraints of a temporary existence. Much of our theological discourse from Vacation Bible School, anybody remember that red Kool-Aid? Yeah, much of our theological discourse from vacation Bible school and Sunday school lessons and even to our seminary classrooms is centered around the idea of immortality. It tends to focus the goal of our salvation as simply a means to get to heaven. In other words, uh, we spend so much of our time trying to get out of the earth But yet the scripture seems to bear something different 
and that God is trying to get into the earth. And according to the Lord's prayer, God wants to get into the earth and we spend a lot of time trying to get out of the earth. Why? Because God is about that life. Jesus, when he engaged his disciples, he taught them to pray. Y'all know the Lord's prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And simply put, God is trying to bring another kind of life here to the earth. For us to experience, and many of us are living beneath our privileges. As believers, we have access to the life of the kingdom that produces an immortality, a living forever. Really, it produces a life that is impenetrable, that causes us to live above and beyond the impacts of this world. This life, it is important for us as believers to remember that God has already made plans and means for us to live an impenetrable life. A kingdom life is not a life that is not impacted by the things of the world, but it is a life that as the world impacts it, it is undaunted and unfazed. A kingdom life is not a life that doesn't go through things, but the kingdom life is a life that when we go through things, the things that we go through don't have us, but we are able to have control of it. When I say impenetrable, I mean unmoved and unfazed by what goes on around us and even what happens to us. I heard the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 58 say it this way. Therefore, my beloved on the screen behind me, brethren, be steadfast. Look at somebody and say, be steadfast. Be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. The reason why is God has already given us the keys to immortality, and the keys to immortality is wrapped up in this one word called eternal life. And in the text, Jesus says to Nicodemus, a Pharisee, a teacher, and a ruler of the Jews, he says that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Tell somebody I'm about it, about it. Jesus is describing to Nicodemus what it means to live a kingdom life or what the end results are or benefits are of living a life of the kingdom of God. Like I said before earlier, if it was just all about you knowing Jesus as your Savior, God could have taken you then to heaven. But what God's been trying to do over the last 2,500 years or so and throughout all time and eternity is to get into time and to bring the essence of his life into time so that earth and our lives become a mirror image reflection of his life in heaven. Jesus is describing to Nicodemus in this text what it means to live a life of the kingdom of God. Watch this one now. And what the end results are of living that life of the kingdom. Watch it now. The word eternal in the text is this Greek word aeonias. And here's what it means. It means this is the word that begin that means without beginning and in that which always has been and always will be. It is the word that means without beginning, without end, never ending or never ceasing. It's a word that means everlasting. But now we really don't get an understanding of eternal life unless we couple that word with the word life here in the text then we're able to decipher the meaning of what it is that Jesus is referencing to Nicodemus. Now, you've got to remember now, Jesus is, has, has walked among the Pharisees and walked among the Sadducees, and Jesus did not follow any of their religious rules. 
Jesus demonstrated what true spirituality was to the Jews and the Hebrews, to the Pharisees, to the Sadducees, to the Roman world going on around them. And that is to say that sometimes the practice of religion can bind us to bondage, but the practice of Christ-centered spirituality can set us and break us free. What Jesus did was he administered and modeled what spirituality looked like, not the religious regulation and rules of man that can keep us bound in bondage. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, they would pretend to continue to promulgate the practice of Judaism in terms of keeping the Sabbath right at 6 p.m. on Saturday, all the way through to the next day, or 6 a.m., all the way through to the next day at 6 p.m. And all of a sudden, people were still blind. They kept to the ceremonial rituals and demons still ran Judea. They kept to all of the written Mishnah and the Torah and blind eyes were still closed. Deaf ears could not hear. But Jesus showed up on the scene and Jesus started doing stuff like responding to the Canaanite woman and all of a sudden telling her, go home, your daughter is already healed. He did stuff like allowing the lepers to come into his presence and touching the lepers when the Bible, when the, the history of the scripture, I was getting ready to say the Bible, when the history of the scripture at that time was clear that lepers could not be in the presence of a priest and nor could the priest even touch them. And Jesus being both prophet, priest, and king would touch the lepers and allow the lepers to touch him. And while they were on their way to go show themselves, y'all ain't hearing what I'm saying to a man-made priest they were already healed Jesus broke all the religious rules because he was simply about you being able to live a different kind of life here on earth can I translate it for you in other words you shouldn't be walking around with your head down and walking in debt despair and poverty and calling yourself a Christian you ought to be living above the temporary circumstance that you find yourself in all because you are about that kingdom life. <laughs> Look at 2 Corinthians 3 and 6 says this, who also has made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit, where it is, for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Jesus would sit at the tables with sinners. He would be seen in the houses of tax collectors. He would go into their houses, have fellowship with them, and eat with them. He would heal people on the Sabbath day. Jesus was astounding to the religious rulers of his day. And when he preached, he didn't preach seven steps to help like we do today. He didn't preach your next breakthrough and miracle and blessing is coming now. He didn't preach that you're getting ready to blow up from the flow up. No, Jesus didn't preach that. Jesus preached one message, and I think we ought to get back to it today to qualify what I'm saying to you. Let me just give you Matthew 15 and 30 on the screen behind me. Then great multitudes came to him. You ain't really got to market your ministry. If Jesus is present, they'll come to you, preacher, watching me on social media. Having with them the lame, blind, mute, and maimed. I wish I had time to preach. And many others that they lay down at the feet of Jesus and what does the text say on the screen and he what healed them mark 1 and 34 then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many what demons and he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him don't you know that the devil knows who you are the issue, the only issue is whether or not you are considered a threat to the kingdom of darkness or not. And the only way you can be a threat to the kingdom of darkness is you got to be about that kingdom life. Mark 3 and 10, here it is. For he healed many so that as many had afflictions pressed about him to touch him. Luke 4 and 40, here it is on the screen. When the sun was setting... And all those who had any that were sick with various diseases brought them to him. God help me. And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. Jesus preached the kingdom of God and following the kingdom of God was the demonstration of signs and wonders. 
If we wonder oftentimes, Ty, why there isn't really the manifestation of signs and wonders, I think we might want to check what it is that we're preaching. Do we preach what Jesus preached? And do we then administer what Jesus administered? Jesus began to administer the kingdom of God to people. Watch this. So that people could have a better life on earth way before they got to heaven. What sense is it to go to the synagogue and keep the religious rituals and still go back home with the same dis-ease? What Jesus was more interested in was the transformational life change of people so he would preach God's kingdom to them and then in the middle of his preaching signs and wonders would break out. Oh, I'm talking to us in here this morning. So now let's come around the mountain and get the meaning of this word, eternal life. The word life here in the text in verse 15 means this. It means the state of one who is possessed with the vitality or is animate. It is the Greek word zoe, of the, and it means of the absolute fullness of life, both essential and ethical, which belongs to God and through him both the hypostatic logos and to Christ to whom is the logos that put on human nature. In other words, the word life is the thoughts of God made reality in the person of who Jesus is. The word zoe means a real and genuine life that is active and vigorous, that is devoted to God, that is blessed in the portion of life that it is given, even in this world of those who put their trust in Christ, but after the resurrection, I like this, to be consumed or consummated by new ascensions where they become more perfected in their day-to-day -day living and lasting forever. What God in Christ has done for us through Jesus is give us access to the kind of God kind of life before the impact of sin has ever touched our lives. It is the life of a quality. It is the God kind of life of quality. Here it is, where there is no separation between us and God, where we're able to live in perfect wholeness. In other words, eternal life has less to do with a life everlasting and more to do with the kind of quality life that you're living on earth way before Jesus comes. People looking at me like I got five heads because we haven't done this kind of teaching and preaching before. See, quality, eternal life has got more to do with how you live when you leave this environment. It's got more to do with the state of your life when you are outside of praise and worship. It's got more to do with your attitude, how you function every day. It's got more to do with the spirit that you have. It's got more to do with your thought life and thinking patterns to where that life now begins to show up and how you function every single day. Oh, we're going to get there in a few minutes. Note the commandment in the Garden of Eden. Do not eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of, of good and evil, for in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Sin kills the God kind of life and cheapens our quality of life while we are waiting to die, only to die again and to be separate from God. Can I give you just a little bit more and then I promise you I'll get to preaching in here and we'll have good old fashioned church. The word Eden simply means presence of God. So when God says to Adam, don't eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he is saying in essence to him, when you gain knowledge of yourself independent from me, you will die. With the knowledge that you have of yourself independent from me will cause you to be separated away from me. What sin does is it separates us away from God. Can I go a little deeper? Which is why the Bible says in Genesis 3 and 17 that God put an angel with a flaming sword on the edge of the garden and put Adam and Eve outside of his presence and wouldn't let them come back into his presence lest they live in that state forever. 
And what Jesus came to do was to bring and remove that flaming sword so that we would have access now to the tree of life and access to the God kind of life where we can live better here on earth way before we get to heaven. Look at somebody and say, I'm about that kind of life. Now, there is something about us as human beings where we want to live and operate off of what we know. But God wants us to live and operate with him based upon what his word says. So here in the text, Jesus referenced Nicodemus' history as a Jew in trying to get him to understand what it meant to be born again. A kingdom life begins with and is rooted in what it really means to be saved. Here it is. What it means to be truly born again. What it means to be a Christian in our thoughts actions and behaviors and salvation begins with who Jesus is as the Christ. Now watch the text y'all. The text in verse 14 says this, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. I hear you go Holy Ghost. I'm going to do it again. Listen, a kingdom life begins with and is rooted in what it means to be saved. I went through there too fast. Let me slow it down. A kingdom life is, begins with and is rooted in what it means to be saved. You cannot claim salvation and the fact that Jesus lives in you and habitually, continually practice a sinful lifestyle of this world. You cannot claim, claim, and hold to Jesus as your Savior. Can I put it in our vernacular? You cannot be this holy and this hateful. Because real, genuine salvation will transform your thought life from the inside out. You cannot walk in habitual unforgiveness and be saved. You cannot walk in habitual jealousy, envy, and strife, and gossip, and be saved. You cannot walk in habitual unforgiveness, hateful speech, conniving, backbiting, manipulating, and be saved. You cannot practice habitual habitual perversions of sexuality regardless of what they are and still claim that you know Jesus. There ought to be something on the inside of you when you tell a little what they call white lie that that bothers you and gets on your nerves. Where you feel like the old saints would say a quickening would happen to you when you even thought the wrong thing. Come on, where are all my real saved people out in here this morning? Have I got anybody that's really saved in here? Would you wave at me real quickly? I just need to know if I'm in the right church this morning. You cannot habitually practice that and not have something that goes on on the inside of you. I think last week we tried to say it again, Ty, where Walter Hawkins gave us the song, What Is This? That when I would do wrong, I end up doing right. Hello, somebody. So now it begins with who Jesus is. It transforms, here it is, three areas, our thoughts, somebody say thoughts, our actions, somebody say actions, and our behaviors, somebody say behaviors. Salvation begins with who Jesus is. And in this text, Jesus is trying to explain to Nicodemus, based on his history, what it is that salvation or being born again will produce in his life as a result of connecting with him. Oh, it's going to get gooder and gooder right through here. All of a sudden, Jesus now says, hmm. I think if I tell him the story of the Israelites, his ancestors, in bondage inside of the wilderness, and if I tell him that story, it will remind him of when I have spoken in the synagogue one time, if I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. And so now, in the text, verse 14, look at your Bible. Are we tracking together now? We here? Verse 14, I'm just going to wait on you to just nod your head and talk to me. Are we tracking together now? Are we here? Can we go on to the next phase now? We good? 
Verse 14 says this. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that everyone who believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Ain't that what your Bible says? So now the question becomes, why is it that Moses had to lift up a serpent? Somebody say, why, Pastor? I'm glad you asked the question. The answer is found in Numbers chapter 21, while the children of Israel were on their way to their promised land. Let me pause here and tell somebody, some of your greatest tests in life will always happen while you're on your way to your promised land. I need to stop right here and just kind of interrupt the message and tell somebody things are not going to be peachy king for you always. But when you are on your way to the promise, can I just really make it plain? When you write just about there, all not heaven will break out against you in your life. But look at somebody and tell them, keep going, keep going, keep going. Tell somebody, be about that life, be about that life, be about that life. So here it is in the text of Numbers chapter 21. You ain't got to turn there. I'll put them on the screen for you to give us some, his, some historical significance of this. So the, in chapter 21 and verse 1, here is what happens in the book of Numbers. The Bible says this, that the king of Arad, the Canaanite, who dwelt in the south, that's a whole lot of preaching in that all by itself, heard that Israel was coming on the road to Athrim. Then he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. Now, this is right after Korah's rebellion. So Israel made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. Now, how many times have you ever said, Lord, if you get me out of this one, I will serve you? Come on, who am I talking to here this morning? How many times have you said, Lord, if you heal my body, I'll serve you. Lord, if you get me through here, I'll keep my promise to you. Lord, if you work this out for me, I will do what you ask me to do. And what God has been saying to us in many of the different areas of our lives is, are you really about it, about it? Are you really about the kingdom or are you really about the way of this world? Can I keep going? Verse 3. And watch what the Bible says. And the Lord listened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites and they utterly destroyed them and their cities. So they named that place. The name of that place was called Hormah. I won't got time to mess with it right there. Verse 4. Then they journeyed from the Mount Hor by way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. Look at somebody and say, hold up, wait a minute. Come on, look at somebody and say, hold up, wait a minute. Wait a minute now, wait a minute, 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 wait, wait, just wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We done had water come out the rock. We done had one of the leaders cause an insurrection. God done came down and opened up the earth, swallowed them up. We done got hungry and he let quail come from the heavens. We done got hungry and he let bread, manna, come from the heavens. We owed our way to the land flowing with milk and honey. One of our adversaries has heard about us and attacked us and taken some of us prisoner. We done fell on our face and called out to God and said, Lord, will you deliver us? We done gave God a praise break and then did the whole war cry. And God showed up and met us. And the history of the text records that God delivered us from our adversary. And while we were on the way after the deliverance from our adversary, our soul got discouraged. Ain't that what the text here says? And I'm not making this up, am I? 
Verse 4 said, to go around the land of Edom and the soul of the people became very discouraged. Watch it now, verse 5. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Pastor Battle, as you launch and plant your church, don't you think for a moment that people will not equate what goes on in their lives to you and God? Uh, because they surely will equate what goes on in, your, in their lives to you and God. All Moses did was bring the Ten Commandments down and say, this is the word of the Lord. But the people spoke against God and Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Let me stop here and say this to some of us. Don't let your soul get the best of you while you're on your way to your promise. Don't let your soul, in other words, come here, Scarface, don't let your mind play tricks on you while you're on your way to your promise. Can I say it to you like this? Your soul is what needs to get saved. Your spirit, once you receive Jesus Christ, your spirit connects with God, and your heart is working through a transformation process, but your head got to get right. Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions, and they will have the best of you when you come under pressure. The thing will, that you experience is designed to have you running crazy, but what God wants to do is he wants you to watch your mouth while you're under pressure. Mm -hmm. Look at somebody and say, watch your mouth and be about that life. I'm going to tell you why. Watch this. Second half of verse 5, Israel says, For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. Wait a minute, 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 wait a minute. You ain't had no food. And now you calling the bread manna that's fresh every morning worthless. Mm -hmm. Look at verse 6. It is almost as if God says, oh, my providing for you is not enough? I tell you what. Verse 6, so the Lord sent. Did the screen in your Bible say the Lord sent? So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. I tell you what would really cause churches to start swelling and start filling up again. When we start complaining and the Lord let stuff happen to us and some of us start dying off. Now I'm not preaching doom and gloom. I'm not preaching that. I still want you to be happy in Jesus. But we, 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 we can't catch the vapors and lose ourselves. We're talking about the eternal everlasting God of heaven. That will open doors and make ways for you out of no ways. Paul said, I, whatever state I found myself in, therein I learned to be content. Let me get on back to this. Look at verse 7. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned. Ain't, won't nothing make you repent like death. <laughs> for we have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Look at them. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Verse 8, then the Lord said to Moses, here's what I want you to do. Make a fiery serpent, here it is, set it on a pole, and then it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. Verse 8 again, then the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent. Set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent, God help me, and put it on a pole. And so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. I need to tell somebody right here, watch out for the snakes around you. Watch out for the snakes around you because the snakes around you will cause you to complain against your God. Sometimes 
times God allows the snakes in your life to bite you because the snakes in your life will drive you back to God. Lord, help me in here. You got to watch out for four-tongued folk that say one thing in your presence and something else behind your back. Snakes are spineless creatures. If I could give the history of it, the serpent, the Bible says, was more subtle than any beast of the field. But when the serpent deceived the woman, God shows up. The man is cursed with thorns and thistles from the ground. The woman has to experience pain and childbirth. But the whole cosmological, the whole biological, and the whole metamorphosis process with the serpent happens to him. Because the serpent, now notice, the serpent is more subtle than any beast of the field. I promise you this is going to make sense in about five more minutes or maybe I can get it done in two more minutes. And any more, any more beast of the field. So in other words, all beasts have got four legs. And if you read Genesis 3 carefully, the serpent stands up on its hind legs and is talking to this woman. But when the, curse, when the curse comes, watch what the Bible says. Because you have done this, cursed shall you be and crawl on your belly. And all of a sudden, the whole makeup of this being is transformed because of deception. Which is to simply say to us, be careful of the stuff and the forked tongue things that go on around you because much of it is spineless. The serpent goes from having a spine to now not having a spine. What's the point about that preacher? The kingdom is designed to cause you to walk upright before the Lord. But the way of the world will cause you to slither around through life's existence. Here it is. Snakes, they're spineless creatures. Now watch this now. Watch this. God never forces himself on us. Here it is. I need to give you this right here. Luke 22 and 3. Then Satan entered Judas, surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. If the devil can enter into the serpent, here is an evidence of him entering into the heart of Judas. Tell somebody, be careful what you say out of your mouth. John 13 and 27. Now after the priest of bread, Satan entered him. Then Jesus said to him, whatever you do, go do it quickly. It's important for us to stand the psychology of your betrayer and the narcissistic, envious, jealous tendencies of those that are used as serpents around you in your life. And in the text, God says to Moses, go take the same snakes that have bitten them and make a bronze serpent, set it up on a pole, and for everyone who was bitten, when they look at the serpent, they shall be healed. Life has a way of biting you to the point where it will bless you. I'm going to do it again. Life has a way of biting you to the point where it will bless you. I'll say it again. Life has a way of biting you to the point that it will bless you. Jesus said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. And what is happening in Numbers chapter 21 is a precursor to the death of Jesus on the cross. And what God does is he gives through allegory and metaphor what sin does to the life of the believer. Go back, read it again now. Might as well wind it up right here. What happens is there is venomous poison that gets in to the blood of Israel. This venomous poison causes them to now begin to experience death. They get the venomous poison because of their complaining against God. After God has already blessed them. And God has said to them, you will now be blessed by what bit you if you look to me. 
what has happened to many of us in our lives is that if we take an honest look at our lives, we have gotten into what we are in by our own volition. And because of our disobedience, we have gotten bitten by life. But if we will turn our attention and focus to God while we have been bitten, what will end up happening as, as we look to God, we will then get healed. Okay. Now, all of that, and what does that have to do with Palm Sunday and eternal life? I'm so glad you asked the question. Because... When Jesus is lifted up, he says, I will draw all men unto me. Palm Sunday is the reminder about the Passover season. It's the reminder that God took the blood and put it on the doorpost of an unblemished lamb. And when there was a spirit that came and took all of the firstborn of Egypt, they died but those who were under the blood were healed. But wait a minute, preacher. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm bitten by a venomous snake. And there is poison in my blood. I kept wondering, Pastor Senior, why am I talking about this on Palm Sunday? There is venom in my blood and what's in my blood is causing me to die but now God told Moses what bit them will bless them if they look to me and on Palm Sunday coming around the mountain is the celebration of a remembrance of the blood that set Israel free and here, Jesus is telling Nicodemus, you will have access to eternal life the same way Israel had access to eternal life. If they look to me, the power of the blood will help bring healing to them. And if you look to me now and not your religious ritual, it's the power of the blood that I'm getting ready to shed for you that will bring healing to your life. I went all the way around the mountain just to tell somebody the blood still works. That the blood still has power. That the blood still has healing. That the blood still has deliverance. That what you think was meant to bring about a curse in your life was really meant to cause you to experience a blessing in your life. If you ever look to Jesus and remind yourself that the blood still works. I don't care what the sickness is, the blood still works. I don't care what the venom is, the blood still works. I don't care what bits you, the blood still has power. I don't care what is removed from you, the blood still covers. The blood will still work in every area of your life. And here it is. Notice that in the text in Numbers 21, when they looked at this fiery serpent, as long as they kept their eyes on the serpent, they were healed. And that serpent becomes a blessing to them. And as long as we keep our eyes on Jesus, we are healed. Jesus has become a blessing to us. And what has bitten us drives us to him and drives us in his presence. Questions for you is this. What's driving you to Jesus this morning? I, I ask this way. What has bitten you? What has caused you to become bitter in your life? What has caused you to no longer trust God? What experience have you had that you attribute to God when you should attribute it to your own self and your own disobedience? What have you missed that you need to go back and relook at again and get a new focus on? When you do that, you'll then have the opportunity for what bit you to become a blessing for you. I'll close by simply saying it like this. 
Some of your greatest ministries is going to come out of your biting. Some of the greatest points of where God's going to use you in your life is going to come out of where you have been bitten. And the key about living the life of the kingdom is not to focus on where you've been bitten, but to focus on the blessing and the biting. Oh, you miss it. <laughs> there, there, there's a blessing in your biting. The blessing is this. It will cause you to think differently about the choice you made that puts you where you are. Quiet so much. Here it is, Eric. Quiet so much, the cockroach is shouting on the velvety red carpet. Because all too often, we want to look for God, come rescue me. Jesus, come save me. News flash. Jesus has already done his work. Salvation is already yours. The choice is, will you live by the kingdom or will you not? The choice is, will you trust God in the ways of the kingdom or will you not? Will you honor God in the ways of the kingdom or will you not? I know this is foreign. This is foreign. This is foreign. But what God wants us to do is to live better. And our living better has to do with the choice in choosing his way and allowing what has bidden us to become a blessing to us. Would somebody just give the Lord glory, honor, and praise right there? I got a whole lot more, but I'm way out of time. Come on, stand on your feet. I want us to just have a, maybe two minutes of some reflection within ourselves this morning about the biting of our life experience. Come on, would you just take a few minutes and start to examine your life? I couldn't think of a better time than to examine ourselves than on this Palm Sunday where the blood brings about a transformation in our lives. Would you just take a few minutes and go to the places where you know you've been bitten and start to ask God, Lord, how did I get there? What you'll find is there was some choice, some decision somewhere along the way that enabled you to make a decision that puts you right there. The hope is this. The blood of Jesus has already been shed. It has already been poured out. It has already been administered. All you got to do is make a decision. I'm going to let this bless me because I'm going to put my eyes and focus on Jesus. If that's you this morning, I'm not asking you to come to the front. I'm going to pray for you right where you are. If you can be honest with yourself and say, Lord, I put myself here, but I'm having a hard time allowing this thing that has bitten me for me. I'll say it again. Lord, I put myself right here, but I'm having a hard time of this thing that bit me to become a blessing for me. If that's you this morning, raise your hand. I'm going to pray for you right where you are. I see you on my right. I see you. 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 Put your hand down. I see you. Father, in Jesus' name, those hands that were raised this morning. I pray, oh God, that you will take the sting out of the biting. That you remove the sting from the biting where they will no longer feel the impact of that pain from being bitten by that moment. I thank you, God, that they have chosen, Lord, to acknowledge where they are. Now, Lord, let grace come on every hand that was raised this morning. Let the grace of your presence, the grace of your presence come on every hand this morning. Lord, I thank you that the blood still has power and still works. And that cleansing and healing can happen for them so that they can experience an eternal life. A quality of life change where they live differently tomorrow and Tuesday and Wednesday. Thank you, Lord, for what's already been done for each of my brothers and sisters. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Somebody said amen. Come on, if you feel that change, would you give the Lord a hand of praise right there? Hallelujah. No, really, if you feel that, would you just give the Lord a hand of praise right there? Look at somebody and tell them, I'm about that life. I'm free now. Now, come on, look at them and tell them, I'm about that life. I'm free now. Come on, tell somebody behind you, I'm about that life. 
I'm free now. Tell somebody across the room, I'm about that life. I'm free now. Anybody feel that freedom in the room? Hallelujah. Hallelujah.